Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our webinar this afternoon. I'm just going to double check. Jane, can you hear me? Yes, Joe, can you hear me as, as well? I can. Brilliant. Fantastic. Lovely. Super. Welcome, everybody, to this uh, webinar this afternoon. This is the fourth in our series of webinars on how to get the best out of your people in these remote times. I'm Jo Evans, I'm head of the employment team at Myerson, and I'm joined with by Jane Marks from The Better People this afternoon. The Better People are specialists in helping businesses improve employee performance and as a consequence business performance. Jane is one of the founders and an experienced leadership and resilience coach. Today we're going to talk to you about managing people through change. So uh, many businesses have obviously had to adapt to operating on a home working basis for over a year now, but attention is turning to moving back to the office. So we want to look today at how to support employees through this change. Um, and so Jane is going to talk about that. And then I'm also going to talk about some of the legal do's and don'ts of returning to the office as well. So. Um, without further ado, Jane, I'm going to hand over to you, if that's all right, to talk to us about managing people through change. Thank you, Jo. What a lovely introduction. OK, so I just wanted to throw a question out to everybody uh, to get you thinking. When we talk about change initiatives, what percentage do you think of those change initiatives in business are successful? So I won't go into a Bruce Forsyth moment and do higher or lower, but this might surprise you that of the programmes that were very or moderately successful at 31%, 43% was somewhat successful and 26% were not successful at all. And these figures were actually quoted through John Cotter's work in Leading Change, and he's been widely cited source for this statistic. So even after years of study, this is an estimation that more than 70% of change needed either fails to be launched, even though some people clearly see the need. So we, it's really important to think about that, isn't it? Because as businesses and business leaders, you're reliant on change, you're reliant on evolution, on looking to the way that your markets are going and staying ahead of the curve. And as Joe has said, this is really pertinent now when we think about the changes we're coming through the pandemic and what that means for business as well. So the fact that many change initiatives fail to achieve their intended outcome, what are some of the reasons for that? So I just want to share again some research in this area for you to start to consider why these change initiatives fail to get off the ground. And here you can see some of the main reasons for this. But what you'll be drawn to see from this statistic is that the single biggest reason that employees resistance to change is also going hand in hand with the fact that management aren't supportive of the change. So the biggest contributor to the level of resistance to change is that employees just don't either believe in it or want to change throughout that initiative that you are, are putting forward in the business. And having well-prepared leaders equipped with the right information is essential to support that change. So not underestimating the amount of work that's involved there, the amount of information that your, your management team need to get that change initiative off the ground. This, as you can also see, is followed by investment and resources, having adequate budget, and other factors which include actually sitting down to think about the execution of the project itself, the project plan. And I know having worked in organizations for many years, as leaders or business owners, you will often be two steps ahead of the rest of your workforce in terms of seeing the change, working your way through it with your management team. And then often, and I know I've been guilty of this in the past, we just tell the change, we announce it, and we think that's enough. So knowing that change initiatives cost an awful lot of money, time, and investment, we can also see here that actually thinking about the execution of the plan is critical. And one of the consequences of mismanaging change is that we just underestimate the human response to change, but also the effort that's required in order to successfully get that off the ground and implement it. So when we think about change, it comes back to the fact that change is more about managing the journey than announcing the destination. 
And, you know, again, when I'm mentioning this to you, you might think yourself of many change initiatives, whether that's moving to hybrid or coming back to office based working, taking the time to think about the journey from your employees perspective is critical if you are going to book the trend of leading a successful change initiative. So what are some of the reasons why humans resist change so much? So you can see here some of the major reactions that we have to major change. This is the human element. People basically fear change. And when we're faced with change, we have a number of different reactions that you can see here, right the way through from anger to hopeful and energized. But the bulk of us in the middle are a little bit skeptical, maybe a bit fearful often distrusting about the intentions of why we are doing this or uncertain but open. And if you think about your own workforce and think about who, when you have led them through change, where would you put them in these categories for how you have experienced them respond to change? Humans also have a greater or lesser capacity for change. And what's a critical component of this as well is how much change we've experienced in the recent past. So if you think about the last 12 months that we have all been through, how much change have we all experienced? We've had to go through, what are we on our fourth lockdown now? Um, certainly in the greater Manchester area, we've been in tier three for an awfully long time, even before where we are today. So how much change that we've experienced is also another critical component to overlay on this. So what you're dealing with as leaders and as individuals yourself are these four fear factors or key areas when we think about change. And put simply, if we don't consider the human response to change, then we get resistance. And as we've seen in the earlier statistics, that's the number one reason why change fails. So we fear change because we question our security, our relationships, you know, how's this going to work if we, we work hybrid or remote? What does that mean in terms of the relationships I have with my customers, my clients, my colleagues? Status is also another one. What does this mean for my job? Will I be seen to have the same level of standing with new customers if I'm working remotely or impacted by change? But also above all is control. Humans like to feel that we have control, which is why the last 12 months has been so difficult for us as well. So it's therefore critical to plan for this human response to change. And I'm going to turn here to the work of William Bridges. Some of you may be familiar with this, but this model by Bridges really illustrates this further by explaining how we experience the emotional side of change, all those fears, how and where do they pop up? But what I want to draw your eye to is the left hand side, that Y axis. So you can see the roller coaster of emotions that people will experience from shock, denial, anger, apathy, frustration, confusion on the left hand side, right the way through to engagement, excitement and high energy when we can when we've really bought into the change. But as leaders, what does that impact on that emotional journey is here on the left hand side, it's productivity. So productivity could be morale, it could be engagement, it could be get out of bed in the morning to complete your tasks, all of the above. So the effects you know, we have on engagement affects productivity and that's crucial to your business, isn't it? In terms of getting through the tasks that you do, delivering and executing on your job. So, your employees, we as humans, will go through some few or all of these emotions in response to change. And it's important, therefore, to think about then how can we effectively move people from the left hand side of this curve, from that shock and denial, through that dip of productivity and over to the right hand side, which is where people are fully engaged, they've accepted the change, they're excited, and they're looking forward to perhaps in this example, returning to the office. So here are some practical things that, that we can offer to help you get started with this. So if you think about here, sorry, the endings on the left hand side of this curve, new beginnings on the right, and then in the middle, we have this neutral zone. I just wanted to share three at uh, these three areas with you and some practical things for you to consider as leaders. So an ending, if you like, is departing with an old way of doing things. 
Um, you know, you may see an overreaction in people. That's all those emotions of denial, anger, frustration that we've seen on that curve on the left hand side. But above all, it's questioning. And the questions are primarily, how does this affect me? How am I impacted by the change? What does this mean to me? And that's where you get that resistance, it's questioning. So what can we do about that? So as leaders, it's really important to create alignment. When you're thinking about planning that change, perhaps back into the office or hybrid working, acknowledge what might be lost as a result of that change, as well as giving people the vision for what's possible by making the change. So you just need to be honest, what's good about it, what's bad about it, because that helps to overcome that skepticism in the middle. You can do that by having real clear communication and giving people time to ask questions. So making sure that your managers are visible, giving people the opportunity to drop in and ask questions, having well thought through prepared answers, or, or above all, being able to listen, field those questions, consider them as a management team and give good considered fact-based responses. So be visible, listen and increase empathy a critical skills. In the neutral zone then you'll see anxiety rise, motivation, people will be questioning, they'll be going through, oh can I do this? But motivation might fall as a result as well, we're contemplating what this means for us. And people might feel a bit overwhelmed, disorientated or still questioning, can we do this? So the trick in this middle section is to spark motivation. Keep communicating a strong vision or what this will mean to us in the positive sense and a direction. Do you remember earlier I said we can often announce a change and then go straight to hitting the accelerator pedal and we're now going to execute on this next week. What, we're going back to the office next week? Hang on a minute, I've not had a chance to think through this. So give people time. Think about if you want them to return to the office, communicating that earlier so that people can get their household in order, their head around the change and plan for it. But also reward small steps and progress, remove any barriers, have conversations with people that might need to make more arrangements for getting back to work in this example. And above all, provide training and support for people if that's needed. And then to really get people through to the right hand side, then continue to focus on developing capability and knowledge. So this is all about being future focused. It's about experimentation and problem solving. Humans love to problem solve. It's why we like doing Sudoku's or the crosswords or jigsaws. So again, think about moving people from the left to the right hand side of this curve by inviting them to be part of the solution. Sometimes as management teams, we feel that we've got to have all the answers, but actually engaging your team in working through how can we successfully move people back to the office also helps to bring people with you. So provide an environment where you can get them involved. But if it's a different type of change that requires new skills, new capabilities, then appreciate and celebrate when they've completed their training and they start to put these new skills into practice. Failing fast should be seen as a celebration. So don't hold people out to dry, reward people for trying things and getting it wrong. Create a safe environment for them to do that and use your coaching, coaching skills to lead them in the right direction. But above all, this is all underpinned by communication and visibility. So give people time, make sure that you communicate and give people the opportunity to ask questions. So in summary, there's, there's really three things to consider when you're leading your teams through change, but I really wanted to highlight these three. And this is from work again, conducted by Forbes and Harvard Business Review. I'd be happy to send you the link to this really interesting report. I mentioned earlier, didn't I, that people have different capacity for change, but it's also a major factor is how much change we've also been through in the last 12 months. And I would argue that we have all been through that together. So these are three critical leadership and management skill, skills to dial up right now. That is empathy, trust and respect. You've got to really seek to understand somebody's point of view in this because if you have still concerns about self-isolating, being fully vaccinated, your health, that's going to dial up the fear factor even more. So it's about creating that 
trusting environment between your team, your employees and your management team as well. Creating the shared exciting vision for the future. So in our example about hybrid working or coming back to the office, what's good about it? What's great about it? What's the opportunity for people to come back to the office and, and how can you create that vision and in your communication? But above all, increase engagement. Make sure that you're having that human contact with people to help them process the change. And also respect the fact that people have different capacity for change. I want you to bring to mind the image of a thimble, a teacup and a bucket. Some people have a bigger capacity for change. So they're your buckets. They can take a lot of change. They quite like it. They find it exciting and energizing. Other people's vessel is more towards a thimble. They're the ones that are going to struggle to cope with this. And your teacups, well, they're going to be somewhere in the middle. But if they're on a saucer, you're going to see that change seeping out over the top. So just keep an eye on how your team is reacting. And you can do that by checking back on that emotional response to change. You know, if Joe's experiencing change, and I know Joe, she's massively positive, you know, all about opportunity. But if I notice Joe feeling a bit apprehensive, a bit quiet, I need to pick up the phone to her and just check that everything's okay. So use your management skills to think about where is your team on that change curve? How do you know? And what signs are you seeing in how they're showing up at work to give you a clue about how they're feeling about that change as well? Okay. So I hope that's been helpful in terms of thinking of some key areas. There are also, we're going to provide this to you as well as a handout from today. If you are considering making that change to hybrid working, then here are some really interesting tips for you to consider. And this is, has come from a recent report from um, the Chartered Institute of Management that I thought would be really relevant for those of you on the call today who are considering this or who might already be making this transition. So I'm not gonna go through these seven in detail, but I will just touch on why these are so important. The fact that people have been working remotely in certain sectors for some time is going to be quite a shock if you then say to them, you know, you've got to be back in the office or we're going to measure you on your inputs. By far and away, and we mentioned this in one of our earlier webinars, managing people by outcomes brings out the best in people. So remote working has now changed the definition of productivity and it's adapting the way that you measure the impact of your team, the contribution of your team and, and employees to a more outcomes focused rather than output sourced inputs. So that's measuring them by their outputs rather than their inputs. Trust is really crucial when we talk about hybrid working. The physical workspace has become, you know, a degree of control for us as managers. We can see people in the office. We can get a little bit fearful when we can't see people. So again, avoid micromanaging people and you know, trust is critical to productivity. So if your teams have performed well remotely, you need to acknowledge that. And remember that if there's been little impact on the outputs and the productivity of your team, then again, avoid the temptation for them to feel like you're going back to micromanagement. Again, work is what you do. Um, work is no longer where you go, it's what you do. So under a hybrid model, then, you know, it's considering all the benefits that you've had as employers having worked remotely and what can you hang on to when you go back. And the other thing as well is this, you'll need to run things differently. So think about how you run your meetings. You know, they, they may need to evolve. Your working practices are going to need to change, aren't they? So how can you make sure that your working practices and your workforce planning are set up? such that you can have people working remotely as well as physically in the office as well. But I will send you the link to this report because it is really, really fascinating. It's got some really useful insights if you are on that bridge to considering moving to hybrid working. But another massive factor to this and really important is the legal aspect. And this is where my expertise completely runs out. So I'm going to hand to Joe, who's going to cover off the legal considerations for hybrid working. So Jo, I'll hand to you now. Thank you, Jane. That's great, really helpful, thank you. Um, we're now being asked lots of questions by clients about returning people to the workplace and the legal 
pitfalls and um, uh, issues to watch out for. So I just wanted to take the opportunity today to cover a few of those off. Um, looking first at the current legal framework and where we are in this COVID journey, um, the guidance from the government continues to be at present, continue to work from home if you can. Obviously, lots of businesses have returned to work because their employees can't work from home, but a very large number of office workers um, have proved over the last 12 months they can work from home and so should continue to do so, says the government. Um, but I think increasingly employers are testing the water with employees returning into the office. Um, and that is fine, although you do have to have COVID secure workplace arrangements. Um, you've got obligations um, to protect the health and safety of your employees. You've got obligations to carry out risk assessments and make sure you implement any appropriate changes to keep people safe at work. And the important thing is, as I think we've all learnt over this journey, is how things change and how quickly things change. So it's checking back to the government guidance all the time because it's changing all the time and you need to make sure you stay compliant. Think about whether you want to test staff. Um, it's not compulsory, but um, a lot of employers have introduced lateral flow testing for their employees. Uh, it's encouraged by the government and it's reassuring for staff as well. Um, think about your vulnerable and your reluctant returners. Um, I'm sure that there are plenty of people out there. They're on that change curve that uh, Jane's just been talking about. Um, it's really important to talk to them to understand their concerns. Uh, you have a legal duty not to put your employees in serious and imminent danger. But if you have carried out your risk assessment and you've put appropriate COVID secure arrangements in place at work, you can be saying to employees, you should start thinking about coming back to the office now. Um, if you get serious resistance, um, question what you do about that. You might want to say, OK, continue working from home. You might want to say it's really important to us that you come back to the office and therefore take unpaid leave if you don't come back. Um, you might ultimately get to disciplinary um, situation, although in the current environment with the government guidance saying work from home if you can, I think that would be quite brave. Um, step four will be the next change. It might be on the 21st of June. Obviously, we're waiting for the government to tell us whether that will be the case or not. The intention is that all social distancing obligations will fall away at step four, but again, we, we don't know for sure whether that's going to ha happen or not. And obviously that will make a big difference on the environment at work that people will be working in. So we just need to keep an eye on that. But in the meantime, plan for the future now, um, get, get your arrangements in place, start your communication with your employees to make sure you're getting a good change process in place. Keep flexible with your plans because things might change, but start that consultation and communication with employees. Think about whether you want everybody back on the 21st of June or the start of step four, whenever that will be. Are you gonna wait until everybody's vaccinated? Are you more comfortable um, taking that approach? Do you want to have a transition period where people come back gradually uh, with reduced numbers, but perhaps gradually increasing? Are you going to have everybody back, everybody at home or a hybrid arrangement? Get, answer those questions now and start talking to people now about that. And, and, and that gives you the best chance of success. So turning to the, the questions that are most frequently coming up at the moment, um, firstly, can we ask our employees to come back to the office full time? So it's been a fabulous experiment of home working that we've had to go through, but can we now say that's it, everybody back? From a legal point of view, you need to look at the contractual terms that employees were engaged on previously as a starting point. Um, at, when the pandemic started, everyone had to go home, no matter what their contractual terms were, obviously, because it was a, a state of emergency. But as the impact of the pandemic comes to an end, um, 
arguably we revert back to those terms in people's contracts and, and most people will have contractual terms that say you are based in the office and you work in the office full time. So from a contractual point of view, it, that should be straightforward. However, two things that are really important to think about. One we've covered at previous webinars, if you don't give people choice, then they, their effectiveness reduces. If they've worked well at home and you're then insisting they have to work in the office, they're going to be disgruntled about that. Secondly, you've got the risk of constructive dismissal claims. Um, employees may well argue that they've worked effectively at home and therefore it is not reasonable to insist that they come into the office. We're anticipating this will be the big area of claims that are arising over the coming weeks, depending on how employers treat their employees. So really important to listen to employees' concerns, act reasonably. Um, why do you need everybody in the office all the time? Is it for supervision? Is it for collaboration? Could they do some of the, the, the working week at home? What are other employers doing in your sector? Are you out on a limb or are you being uh, uh, approaching things in the same way as most others? Really important questions. Can we introduce hybrid working? Um, I, I'll make the assumption that that will require a change to your terms and conditions of employment um, because most people won't have had that in place. Some will, of course, but most will not have had that in place in their contracts previously, pre-COVID. So if you need to make a change to terms, then you need consent from employees. You can't impose a change without consent. And therefore, it's really important to consult with your employees and reach agreement legally, obviously, but also for employee relations reasons. So be very clear about why you're suggesting the change. I mean, I would imagine with hybrid working, a lot of people will be very happy with that now. Um, it, that seems to be the direction of tra uh, travel. Be clear, are you offering it as an option or is it compulsory? Um, explain why you're suggesting the arrangements you're suggesting. And as Jane has said, and as each of these webinars, we talk over and over again about communication is, is the underpinning uh, principle to all of this. What about permanent home working? This is something that employers are looking at, or some employers, they're realising the financial savings of uh, not having office space. Um, can you say to people, that's it, you've done your job now for the last um, X months at home, don't come back to the office. Again, I'm assuming that would involve a change to terms of employment and probably quite a significant change and it would need employees to agree to it. Again, consultation um, to seek agreement from employees, explain why it's best for the business, why it's best for them. The other thing to think about is all the other questions and practical issues that flow from this. What financial arrangements are you going to put in place for offering equipment for people to work at home, expenses for those extra costs of working from home? health and safety audits, all of those practical things would need to be dealt with in that communication process. Again, listen to concerns, act reasonably. Another thing I think we've learned from this uh, pandemic is everybody approaches it from a different point of view and you have to look at each individual person individually and what their concerns are and respond to those concerns. Finally, do we need changes to contracts of employment? Um, well, it depends on the change that you're implementing. Um, probably uh, the best thing uh, is, is if you are making changes to contracts of employment or contractual terms, rather than reissuing new contracts to everybody, it would you would be able to secure the changes through email communication, employees signify their consent, either through responding to the emails or some kind of software uh, product where they can signify consent. That would legally give you the evidence of consent that you would need. Think about whether you're doing it on a trial basis or a permanent basis and make that very clear as well. Sensible to give yourself an opportunity to make further adjustments, obviously. Um, but usually in this kind of situation, a full reissue of contracts isn't something that you need. 
So hopefully that helps with a flavour of some of the issues that we've been um, asked about and combined with the employee relations issues and effective change management and the legal piece gives you an overall view. Um, I'm conscious of the time, we've talked away a bit. Um, we've had a couple of questions that were actually pre-submitted by um, attendees. Um, let me just deal with them very quickly. Um, can we insist that employees have been vaccinated before they return to work? Um, this is something that's obviously a bit of a hot topic. Um, you could insist um, is the answer to that. Um, although if you do, you have to be aware that you could face discrimination issues because, for example, pregnant employees, um, the situation is not tested yet as, well as to whether they should be taking the vaccine. You might have employees with religious beliefs that call, mean it's difficult for them to, to take a vaccine or they'd feel more uncomfortable about it. You might have individuals with other concerns and you would much better listen to those concerns and respond to those rather than a blanket um, enforcing the requirement would be my view on that. Um, and then what if employees don't want to return to the office because they are concerned about using public transport? Um, so this is something that I think was particularly an issue earlier on when public transport was seen as, as particularly risky. Um, you are allowed to consider the situation as it evolves and cases are reducing. Um, so um, uh, that, 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 that is something to take into account. There are government rules and guidance on employees' use of public transport. Um, so yes, take into account the current scenario, but also again, listen to employees. If they have got legitimate concerns about safety, then their journey to work is, is relevant in the same way as their, when they are in the office as well. So you do need to think about that. Um, and it might be that they can travel at a different time and that that might be um, something that manages their concern. It might be that it's, it's reasonable for them to continue to work from home for a period of time until it becomes safer again. But again, case by case basis, depending on the individual circumstances is how I would answer that. I've counted through those. Jane, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on, on those as well. No, I, I'm not even going to waft into legal areas, Joe. but you're absolutely right. I think, you know, as we've said, all the points that you've made, it's communication, isn't it? It's, it's talking it through with those individuals and trying to establish what their concerns are and, and ultimately trying to reach a compromise or, as you've suggested there, Joe how can we transition you know could we wait a while could you work from home for a little bit longer and then and eventually come back so no thank you joe great super well um as i say conscious of the time so um i will move on um final few comments and points just to make to, to wrap things up um as i said at the outset this was the last of our four um, webinars that uh, we've been running. We've talked about motivation, engagement, resilience, uh, all sorts, and we will send you links to all of those um, videos. So if you do want to watch them again, you can. Um, I think they all continue to be very relevant, even as we are hopefully returning to some normality. Um, then uh, I think homeworking is going to be a big part of all of our lives for the future nonetheless. Um, so we will send you the links to those as well as the slides from today. Um, uh, as per the slide that's flashing at you now, we'll also let you have details of our new Myerson HR portal, um, which is very disconcerting. I've just seen myself on it. Um, it's just been launched. Um, free access to a wealth of HR documents, guidance, precedents, resources, um, so if you are interested in signing up for that for your business, then please do let us know um, and we can uh, explain how to do that. Um, I'm told that when the webinar finishes, there will be a Zoom feedback form that pops up for you to complete. We'd be really grateful if you would fill that out for us. Um, we do review all feedback we get. It helps us make future events um, that much more relevant to you and as useful to you as possible. So it, uh, we'd be really grateful if you would fill that out for us. Um, 
do get in touch with Jane, with me, or with anyone else in our teams. Our contact details are there. If we can help with any issues that we've talked about today or in the other webinars or indeed at all, then please do get in touch um, and we'd be delighted to talk to you. Finally, I want to say thank you to Jane very much for, for joining and uh, contributing to these webinars and also to Janet Grant who from The Better People who has uh, uh, joined us and contributed to some of the webinars as well in this series. Uh, very grateful for, to you both. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you all. I hope you found this useful. Thanks ever so much for joining and uh, goodbye. Thank you, Joe.